Good to go, Jonathan? Okay. Um, hello and welcome uh, to Empire and Righteous Nation, 600 Years of China-Korea Relations. We are so happy you've joined us today in person um, for today's program. This is the second installment in our new Global View on Korea series, a discussion between Yale University Elihu, Professor of History and Global Affairs, Ad Arn Westad, and the chair of the Korea Society's Board of Directors, Kathy Stevens, a former ambassador to Korea and with extensive diplomatic experience in China as well. Uh, my name is Tom Byrne, and I'm the president and CEO of the Korea Society. Once again, we are pleased to host this program jointly with the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. Our two organizations share a common spirit and long history based in New York City. <clears throat> I would like to express um, the Korea Society's appreciation to the Korea Foundation and to our corporate sponsors uh, for making this program possible. I will soon turn the podium over to Ambassador Susan Elliott, President and CEO of the NCAFP. Uh, but first, uh, Susan uh, has an accomplished career as a diplomat serving in numerous leadership positions, including civilian deputy and foreign policy advisor to the commander of the United States European Command and as ambassador to Tajikistan. Uh, she uh, leads a terrific team at the uh, National Committee. I would also like to welcome the Honorable Jeffrey Schaefer, who serves as chairman of the board of the National Committee. He had a distinguished career in international finance, including 40 years of experience at Citibank, the Treasury, and the OECD. Uh, Jeff also serves as a board member, as a member of the management board of S&P Global Ratings. Um, uh, Jeff and I's paths had crossed um, years ago, decades ago, I should say, um, uh, assessing the sovereign credit consequences of the aftermath of Korea's financial crisis in 1997. Uh, since then, things have changed for the better for Korea, and now the righteous nation is rated two notches higher than the empire by two leading rating agencies. Um, thanks for your support, Susan and Jeff. Uh, finally, I would like to leave you with the, the concluding line from Professor Westad's uh, book, which I think aptly highlights, highlights why the Korea Society has introduced this new program series. In a globalized world, the relationship between China and Korea, so long in the making, so intense in its composition, has the potential of influencing how all of us live our lives one way or the other. Mm. So uh, Susan, the podium is yours. Well, thank you, Tom, for that warm welcome. And I just, on behalf of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy, I'm really pleased to be here today to co-host with the Korea Society, uh, one of our um, strongest partners and colleagues um, in the area. You know, we're really grateful for our long history of cooperation with the Korea Society and uh, for the numerous and valuable programs we've collaborated on over the years. Um, today's topic, as Tom mentioned, is Empire and Righteous Nation. 600 years of China Korea relations. And I think it's a really important one uh, at this point in time. Um, and I think Professor Westat has written about the history of uh, China Korea relations in a really um, good and articulate manner. And I will say, for those of you who haven't read the book, um, you know, when you see the title without looking at the book, you might say, 600 years, that means probably six or 800 pages of things that I have to go facts and figures. But it's really, I highly recommend it. It's a readable book and it's a very good, whether you're a scholar of China and Korea or you're a novice, I think you'll find it very, very informative and it will help you to understand the history of the relationship between the two countries. And I think having been a diplomat, I realized that understanding history, sometimes we forget that we need to look at history um, to understand the current situation, not only in Northeast Asia, but around the world. And in um, Professor Westad's book, again, which I highly recommend, he clearly and succinctly uh, points out the important reasons um, uh, why um, the situation or the history between China and Korea is, is so important. 
And it, again, is a valuable foundation in the current geopolitical dynamic, not only between the co two countries, but also uh, between our own the United States and other countries in the region. Um, as Tom mentioned, Professor Westad is the Elihu Professor of History and Global Affairs at Yale. And in addition to authoring the book that we're going to discuss today, he's author of other books, Restless Empire, China and the World Since 1750, and The Global Cold War, and The Third World Interventions and Making of Our Times, which uh, was a winner of the Bancroft Prize. Um, I also um, want to introduce um, the moderator of today's discussion, or the, the person who will engage with the um, uh, professor, and that's Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, who became the chairman of the Korea Society's Board of Directors in January of 2020. She's also the president and CEO of the Korea Economic Institute. And Ambassador Stevens has a long and distinguished career as a US diplomat. I just heard some things about her upstairs that I didn't know, but she definitely is an expert not only in China, Korea, but also she's a European expert, which is where I worked with her at the State Department. So, and as all of you know, she was US ambassador to Korea. And finally, I think she has a really good understanding of the people of Korea and the, the Korean Peninsula because um, before she was a diplomat, she was a US Peace Corps volunteer back when perhaps the Republic of Korea was a lot different than it is today. But she was there and she studied and learned and understands to me um, the importance of not only US-Korea relations, but um, uh, Korea-China relations. So. Um, as I said, um, the, our two distinguished guests will um, get into a dialogue of the history of China-Korea relations, and then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. And um, for those of you who are watching us virtually, um, we'll also, you'll be allowed to ask questions. So I want to thank all of you for coming today. It's really a pleasure to be able to have an in-person meeting again, and I hope that we can do a lot more of these in the future. So I look forward to a great discussion, and I'm going to turn the program over now to Ambassador Stevens and Professor Wastad. So thank you. Well, Susan, thank you. Uh, and Tom, thank you. And, and welcome to everybody here. It really is kind of a thrill to uh, more than, uh, it is a thrill to see uh, these faces here today and to know we're joined by a very large uh, online audience. I know that because a lot of people have already sent in questions, and one of my jobs is to make sure we leave time for them. I've already seen some that have come in in advance and said, and they've, they're, they're about the, the fierce urgency of now. You know, we're talking about Korea and China, and we just have to turn on, I guess, what is it, NBC or CBS or whatever, and, and, and we see that uh, uh, the issue of that relationship, both in terms of, of sport as well as politics and economy, is uh, very much a, a salient topic. But I want to make sure, and this goes to something Susan was saying, we're both former diplomats about about the importance of history and why I found this book to be as I, I told uh, Professor Westhead we've, we've agreed on first names actually aren't you this is like catnip for me you know uh, and actually one of the things uh, Susan learned about me is I my my first time outside of the Western United States was as a student of history at the University of Hong Kong in the 1970s when we were trying to reflecting on China and Northeast Asia's uh, adaptation or lack thereof to the challenges posed in the late 19th and 20th century and uh, you know if you're a diplomat you're obsessed with history, but oftentimes we're thrown into situations where we know very little. We hear a lot from our interlocutors. I remember hearing in, uh, in the former Yugoslavia over the years, uh, more times than I care to, to repeat, uh, a history starting in 1448 with the Battle of Kosovo. Many, many hours. Uh, Susan and I were both posted at different times in Northern Ireland, and I remember flying from London to Belfast, and uh, one time the, uh, the flight attendant would say, you're now landing in Belfast, turn your watches back 300 years. <laughs> so, you know, we knew it was important, but then the eyes glaze over, right? <laughs> we don't have time for all of this. And here, I think, Professor Weston, you've made such a contribution, uh, and not only because of the brevity and the elegance of your prose, but also because you are so focused on what is the relevance here? What is the relevance? But before we go into that, I really do want to glean from you some of the reasons that, that you wrote this book, how you went about it, because clearly you spent some time talking to a lot of people in China as well as in Korea and doing a lot of research. Uh, and um, and, and, and what, what you, you wanted to, to accomplish with, with this book. Well, thank you, Kathy, and, and thank you to, uh, to Susan and Tom for those wonderful words of introduction. Thank you to the Korea Society and the National Committee on American Foreign Policy for hosting me here today. I'm really looking forward to the, really looking forward to the conversation. And I hope that many of you 
will be able to read the book. It will also be out in Korean very soon. So for those of you who prefer to read it in Korean, can read it in, in, uh, in that language. I can also underline, since it hasn't been said already, that it's a mercifully brief book. <laughs> it's, this is 600 years in less than 200 pages. Um, uh, and therefore, as, uh, as was said earlier on, of course, what I tried to do is to focus in on what I think really matters in that relationship. You have to if you're going to do 600 years in, in less than 200 pages. So this started out as a set of lectures that I gave at Harvard at their invitation in 2017, the Reichauer Lectures, named after the former Harvard professor and US ambassador to, to Japan. So since the title for the lectures that I was invited to do were the Reichauer Lectures, and I was asked to speak about the relationship between China and another country in East Asia, uh, I was thinking quite naturally that I should speak about China and Japan. But then it struck me that that might not be a good idea because there is already a very significant literature on the relationship between China and Japan that is good, in my view, analytically. Um, much more attention is generally given to that relationship overall than to the relationship between China and Korea. And uh, then the practical reason that I'm able to read uh, at least some Korean um, while I don't have Japanese. So I thought to myself, well, that settles it. I'm going to write, uh, I'm going to lecture about China and, and Korea. So it started out as a set of lectures, uh, very interactive. Uh, I also repeated them uh, about a year later, both in Beijing and in Seoul, and got feedback from Chinese scholars and Chinese uh, officials, uh, Korean scholars and officials, uh, which was really helpful for the way that the book came out, and uh, particularly, of course, on more contemporary relation. So just like you said, Kathy, this is a book that tries to explain where we are today in terms of the relationship between China and the two Koreas based on its history. Uh, and of course, as everyone here will know, this is a, this is a very long relationship. Uh, in fact, some of my Korean interlocutors routinely have taken me to task for starting it in, in, in the late 14th century. They think I should start it much earlier why start it just with modern times, one of them wrote. He was very, <laughs> was very annoyed with me. Um, we'll, we'll explore this later, why the book really starts in the, in, in the late 14th century. There are some good reasons for it. But the main reason why I wrote it is to try to make use of the past in order to understand the present. So it's a blatantly presentist book by an historian who is very preoccupied both with the opportunities, but maybe first and foremost some of the dangers that are there in terms of dealing with uh, with, with sino korean relations yeah. so that's well i'll I be think. very interested in hearing some of the feedback you did get from the chinese and koreans along the way and how that affected your thinking but one of the things that i, I wanted to because we can't cover in, sure. in, a, in a 45 minutes the whole even even this this relatively brief look at mm. 600 years uh but one of the things that i think is so valuable about it is is rather than try to just you know cover it in a in a chronological if you like or purely chronological way though there's somewhat chronological you have a couple of big concepts, mm. and they really are encapsulized in the in the title in the mm. way that I didn't understand until I read the book. Um, so, empire obviously being China, and the, the notion of what a Chinese empire is. And um, you talk about Tianxia. I mean, some of the the, the more I guess Asian man the Chinese manifestations of that. But then the notion of and, and and how that that developed into a national identity mm. or transformed, in, in my words, not yours, into the Chinese national identity, which I hadn't really thought too much about. Uh, and then in Korea, of course, the idea that Koreans, and I'm sure you were a nation in, in the way that we might think of it in the West, kind of early on in some ways, uh, and moreover, a very, uh, but a, a righteous nation in the sense mm. of being more Confucian than the Chinese. Mm. Um, is that a fair, uh, as, yeah. as a reader, is that, could you talk a little bit more about that? Because, you know, it's all about nationalism and national identity now, right, as, sure. as, as, as feeding the conflict. But what are the roots of this? And how can we understand better what's going on today by looking at these roots? So that's what's interesting in terms of starting the book in, in the late 14th century. Because uh, with the setting up of the Ming uh, Chinese Empire and the Joseon state in Korea, roughly at the same time, you can get some insights into what it was that drove these two projects, both, both sort of post-Mongol uh, rule projects right, in, in Eastern Asia. And what drew both of them, uh, almost to the same degree, though it might have been even more intense in Korea, uh, was the emphasis on neo-Confucianism. So these were, these were neo-Confucian revolutions. 
the idea was to set up a new state, to construct a new state from the ground up that was based on neo-Confucian ideals about the relationship between individuals, families, and the state. And to create a strong state, uh, a capable state, based on you know, these kinds of concepts. So uh, a lot of people, especially my Korean friends, have wondered, you know, empire is not so difficult. What the empire is here is pretty clear, that's China, um, in its various incarnations. So I deal with two empires here, uh, the Ming and the Qing, and some people would say the People's Republic also as an empire in a way, uh, certainly taking over an imperial space right, mm. in terms of what it has. But why, why righteous and why nation about Korea and starting that pretty early? Well, that's because Korea in many ways during the Joseon era stands apart from the rest of, of East Asia, both in the intensity of its emphasis on neo-Confucian ideology which I think is the right term for it, uh, among the Korean elites, but also because of the particular emphasis on the concept of, of righteousness. Mm -hmm. So we in, in Korean or E in Chinese, um, the idea that uh, righteous means a set relationship between the people who inhabit this kingdom, as it was, um, and the state. And if that is, if that gets out of whack, then there is a lot of trouble, not just with regard to the state itself, but with regard to all of human society, right? So therefore, therefore the elite, the Confucian elite in Korea has to be there to oversee that these principles of righteousness, according to them, are actually carried out. It's a pretty intense kind of setting. I mean, for those of you who have, who have studied Korean history, and you see some of the same in Ming China, not the, not the same kind of intensity, but you see some of it there. So that's one of those things that I find interesting in terms of then taking Sino-Korean relations up to today, that so much of this have, if not the same, then a common kind of origin. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, you know, when you're really very close, study, so students of communism, for instance, yeah, very, very close in terms of ideology, that can lead to cooperation, but it can also lead to an intensity of conflict about what the principles really ought to be. Right? Mm -hmm. And both of those you saw in the, in the Sino-Korean relationship over time. And I think you see quite a bit of that today as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But could you say something about then that question of how did Korea, if it did, maintain its own uh, uh, national integrity yes. for much of this period? notwithstanding this very, very tight, if you like, ideological and philosophical admiration and tie mm. to China of even kind of outdoing the Chinese. Mm. That's where the concept of nation comes into it. And th this is something it, it's always interesting to discuss. So I use the, the term nation, even though this is a term that was created for European purposes, as many of you will know, in Europe in the 19th century, so during the Romantic era. But I use it for Korea because I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not my invention. A number of historians, Professor Habush and a number of others who've written about this before me, uh, a number of Korean scholars have also written about this, scholars working in Korea. Um, and the idea is that there is, a, there is a strength in terms of identity, which is based on where people live, meaning in the Korean Peninsula, the language that they speak, meaning some form of Korean, right? if you go very far back, and I explore that a little bit in the book, and of course, neo-Confucian righteousness, the, 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 the ideological concepts. That's what, what makes people Korean in, in the definition that you see developing during the early Joseon. And that's new. I mean, that, that particular cohesive identity had not been there before. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the great East Asian wars, the Imjin wars at the end of the of the uh, 16th century, then is a kind of furnace for Korea uh, because it is challenged both by Japan and and, 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 and and then by the Qing, by the Manchus, into having a very intense sense of identity. So I think that's the reason why it's possible for, for Korea to be closely associated with the Ming and the Qing, but still stay apart. Um, there are other reasons as well, as I point out in the book. You know, if you want to handle a expansive, um, pretty violent empire, certainly when you get into the Qing era, right next door, 
uh, you have to have good intelligence. You have to know more about the empire than what the empire knows about you. And this was almost a sacred principle for the Joseon, uh, to make use of the so-called tribute missions you know, across the border to Beijing to figure out how the Qing elite actually thought and felt and what their aims were. And it is remarkable when you look at the literature from the um, 17th and the 18th century, how much more the Korean elites know about what's going on in China than vice versa. And that's strength, you know, that's an ability to maneuver in a very difficult situation. Well, we always said, I mean, in the 20th century, and now I guess in the 21st, that South Koreans always knew a lot more about what was going on in the U.S. than we did about them. And I guess they, they felt it was important to do so. And I think we, maybe we see some of those same skills in North Korea with respect to its, its, its important relationships. I think that is true. I think you see a lot of that today. Yeah. Um, so, to, but to get back then, well, I, I, on this question of national identity, another point you make in the book, and you say it's not really about Japan, but it puts mm. Japan in a context, mm. which I think, at least in, in what I had previously read, is not always there, of what that broader relationship with China is about. And as you say, the, the Hideyoshi uh, years, the, the, the Imjin War, was so traumatic for Korea that it really was, in some ways, would you agree, kind of the crucible on which a, a, a sense of Korean identity that went even beyond we eat different food or we have a different language from the Chinese, even though we use Chinese characters, that mm. there really was a... And it was forged on a crucible, though, of being anti-Japanese. Yeah. I think that was a significant part of it. I think the sense that there was a bigger threat than what the empire... At least at most times, a bigger threat than what the empire constituted mm. for, for Korea um, defines much of the actions that... Uh, the Joseon took, and that many Korean national leaders in the 20th century then went on to take as well. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's important to, to realize this. I feel sometimes in, in modern Korean discourse on this that this isn't quite appreciated enough. It's almost as if there is, uh, when I teach this in Seoul and elsewhere, um, among younger Koreans, many of whom do not know all that much about this deeper historical background, almost a sense of shame in the kind of relationship that was there between uh, the Chinese empires and, and Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not feel that that is a good description. I think this is a very practical relationship that they developed uh, under really difficult circumstances, with Japan always looming as a potential threat, mm -hmm. um, but also being able to work out ways in which you could actually deal effectively with the empire next door. I mean, you mentioned Northern Ireland. I mean, I, I draw in the in the book a parallel uh, with other countries that live in the proximity of empire. Mm -hmm. Ireland with regard to England, uh, Algeria, North Africa with regard to France. Mm -hmm. And th these countries were colonized, right? Uh, to the point that they almost lost their national identity by, by, by England and, and by France for a very long period of time. Korea avoided that. And that's not a, you know, that's not a little achievement mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, more credit should be given uh, to, to the people who handle that relationship and handle it reasonably well over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you make the point that, that China over these years never actually had settlers in Korea, or not very many, not, yep. not in, in the sense that there were the French in Algeria or, or, right, or the Scots in, in yep. Ireland and, and so on and so forth. Was that, you think that was a, just a conscious, well, uh, policy by, by Ming or Qing or... or no, were, I think it was it was based on the potential for significant Korean resistance if uh -huh. it was attempted. Um, uh -huh. You see, that's the other part of this relationship, which is so significant, is that the Chinese side, the Ming and the Qing side, always knew that there were boundaries that it would not be good for them to test with regard to the Joseon. Uh -huh. um, they pushed, particularly the Qing, pushed very far in, 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 in you know, you could say Neo-Confucian terms. I mean, the Qing were not great on Neo-Confucianism, but they, they tried. Um, and the, the idea that, that uh, Korea should always be subservient, you know, to the great Qing state, or the Qing great state, to translate it directly. Um, but they also knew, you know, how far they could push. Stationing troops permanently in Korea, and we have several of the emperors talking about this, was off. Mm. Because it would lead, it, it would destroy a relationship that was going pretty well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if you wanted, as the Qing did for a long period, to hold up Joseon as the model ally, mm -hmm. the model vassal, as they would say, well, then you didn't want to create trouble in the relationship by demanding something that you knew the Koreans would refuse, right? Mm -hmm. So it became a kind of 
dance in a way with regard to this, where both sides respected uh, some rules of the game, at least up to a point, at least um, until you get into the 19th and, and early 20th century. So when Xi Jinping told then President Trump in Mar-a-Lago in what, 2017, at least as we know from a tweet from then President Trump, that Xi Jinping told the American president that Korea had always been a part of China. What was that about? <laughs> I, no, to, be, to be honest, I think we have to be very careful taking <laughs> President Trump's tweets as a signal of what was actually said. Uh, I, I think, to be fair to President Xi for once, I, I think he knows his history better than actually having put, put that forward. But I mean, there is this sense of, of of proximity, of close association mm -hmm. that is there in China. Uh, and that is true for today's international affairs as well. Mm -hmm. um, Korea is in the minds of many Chinese, including today's Chinese policymakers, the foreign country that is closest to China. And I, I think here they think not necessarily in policy and strategy terms for today. They do think in cultural terms. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, this is in a way the challenge for today, right, is to, is to work out how can that be part of the equation when we look at Sino-Korean uh, relations overall. But there is also an element in it, as you, as you pointed out earlier, of China always thinking of itself as the center. Uh, they wouldn't use terms as the empire, but they really think like an empire, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for Korea to be the closest neighbor in that relationship isn't always easy. I mean, I find it difficult when I speak to people in China, even in Beijing, to get a clear understanding of, you know, ordinary Chinese, how they understand Korea, right? Um, there is this tremendous admiration for some of what Korea has achieved, not least through uh, Korean television, which is mm -hmm. so immensely popular in China and has been mm -hmm. for, a, for a very long time. But at the same time, it's a little bit uncertain, you know, what is exactly the status of Korea vis-a-vis -vis China, right? Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, I mean, there are openings, there are possibilities, but there are also dangers mm -hmm. in, in that kind of thing. So it's quite unique in that way, it is the, the China, Absolutely. Korea. You can't even really compare it to Vietnam or You can't not compare Taiwan it to or, any or, other country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Not even Vietnam, which probably would be the closest that you, that you get with regard to this. Mm -hmm. um, Mongolia is, of course, a different... Mm -hmm. It's a different story. I think most most Chinese would be convinced today that that is uh, really part of China. I uh, they, they wouldn't yeah. say that, but uh, yeah. that's what I think. <laughs> I want to I want to delve a little bit more into kind of Chinese modern Chinese attitudes towards Korea. But before we do that, I mean, kind of the way going back into history, but the, but the way it's viewed at least from Korea now mm -hmm. and through popular mm -hmm. culture. Um, I'm sure you're probably aware, and many probably in the audience are that the whole. I mean, one of the the sort of uh, uh, in, inflection points in your book, of course, is from Ming to Qing and the way that, that Korea responds to that or fails to respond or it, well, responds mm -hmm. in a pretty disastrous way to it mm -hmm. um, is the topic of innumerable Korean, South Korean dramas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, not that that's always where you should learn your history, but it's where a lot of young Koreans and maybe some of us yeah. who watch Korean dramas are learning our history. And, um, and, and, you know, diff different things come out of it, but mm -hmm. sometimes, I mean, people are, the, the crude, sort of crude analysis is kind of a, the, a, a variation of the Thucydides uh, uh, trap mm -hmm. uh, uh, of Ming as the, as, the, as the status quo power, but say the, the, the bastion of Neo-Confucian, this is the righteous, the righteous empire, I guess, because I'm sorry, Star Wars now, Star Wars now. And, and Qing, the interlocutor, but, but Korea making a bet on, the, on the, the fading power rather than the rising power. Uh, I mean, it's a very crude thing, but I mean, how do, how, how do you see the Ming-Qing uh, uh, change and how, how Korea responded to it and what lessons uh, uh, it could draw or maybe China could draw, we could draw from, from that, that period? Yeah, I mean, that is really interesting because, you know, what, what happened there is that in... Confucian terms, particularly neo-Confucian sort of loyalty, loyalty is a very important concept here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, terms. The relationship uh, from the Joseon perspective to China should always be to the Ming. I mean, the Ming in a way was was constructed in that Joseon imagination as being eternal. It was the empire. I think it should be stable, right? I mean, stability is very important here. So when the Ming then suddenly starts losing, this is very hard to take on board. Mm 
right, in, in in Korea. And you write that the Joseon elite, in a way, was they were late in 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 making the peace, if they ever did, with that change. But on the other hand, they did it enough to be able to survive when the Qing was in place. I mean, I make this point in the in, in the book that, you know, what is remarkable about the Joseon is, of course, its incredible longevity. I mean, it, for, for the empire, there was a break in the middle here, right? In the, in, in, in the early 17th century, Joseon just goes on. And that is quite remarkable when you think about the kind of relationship, very bad relationship that they had with the Manchus and had with the with what became the Qing state before they took over, but they were able to maneuver enough. And I think there are some, for both Koreas today, um, maybe especially for the relationship between the DPRK and, and, and the PLC, there are some lessons that come out of this, right? So the, um, the Joseon leadership continued to, in effect, uh, not just memorialize, but worship the Qing, uh, the, 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 the Ming emperors, even the last Ming emperor who killed himself in the back garden of the, of the imperial palace as he was being overthrown, were made into significant figures in Korea at the same time as the Joseon leaders declared they, their undying loyalty to the Qing. Mm. So you could do both. Right? It's called strategic ambiguity. Strategic ambiguity, <laughs> indeed. And, and they could get away with it up to a point. <laughs> up to a point. So I think that's the, that's the issue with strategic ambiguity today as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, again, the lessons of history, and we've, uh, even though I, I, I never say the name right, but the Thucydides trap, mm. it must be a list I have, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, has been so much in the news when we talk about uh, uh, trying to think about, about U.S.-China relations. Um, I, I suppose if you're sitting on the Korean Peninsula, I mean, I guess they, they talk mm. about being the shrimp among mm. the whales, but certainly, mm. you know, every time there's been a, a, a rising power and, a, and an established power, uh, Korea's got, kind of gotten caught in the, uh, uh, in the crosshairs. Um, I mean, do you do you do you think that they're they're you know that that's a worry now? <laughs> and, yes. yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I, I think it is a it's a profound worry now. I think it has been a worry for Korean states. I mean, throughout their existence, mm -hmm. um, that you have to adjust your policies just enough that you aren't caught on the wrong side as history turns. Mm -hmm. right? That's a long, it's a long set of, of lessons that, that go into that. By the way, my, my uh, friend and, and former colleague up at Harvard, Graham Ellison, when he, 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 he formulated the term to sit at trap, some of my Chinese friends think that that's a conspiracy against the Chinese because no Chinese can possibly pronounce yeah. <laughs> in, in any way that makes sense. I've studied too much Chinese. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, so that argument, which is basically that, you know, the, uh, that uh, how power shifts take place, mm -hmm. right? That that's deeply significant, not just for the great powers involved, but for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Basically what, what Professor Ellison is, is, is saying in that book, I think is really, really important for Korea today. And if you w want to be concrete about it, sort of jumping up to our own time, if we are over time, looking at the power shift between the United States and China in Eastern Asia, where the United States might be less predominant and China more predominant. It is, of course, very important for both Koreas to try to adjust their policy according to that. But that depends on how you actually interpret it. And crucially, it depends on how long you think such a power shift might take, right? Mm -hmm. Because getting ahead is also something that can be really dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, as shown by the Zhou Son and shown by the, the Ming Qing uh, transition. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, with that, you and getting to where we are now, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to just let everybody know, I, 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 we have such a lovely in-person audience. Uh, we have a microphone in a few minutes. I'm, we're going to uh, put it around if you have a question, and then I'm going, we have a lot of questions that have come in online. Mm. I want to leave a lot of time for that. Mm. But... Um, but you're both, you, I think you begin and end the book, um, you begin with the dedication to the peaceful and united Korea of the future. Uh, and uh, I think, and you end with talking about the same thing, I think. But, but the question then, I mean, to pose it in terms of what kind of peaceful and united Korea do you think China would be 
mm. uh, uh, accept, if you like, and what would that relationship be? I mean, is this historical overhang so great that we're talking about something that mm. harks back to a, a quasi uh, empire system or, mm. or influence, or, or are mm. we in a different world of Westphalian nation states and we will proceed accordingly? Mm. Uh, now, that's one of the points, I think, Kathy, where, where history really is important in two different ways. So, you know, uh, for a country that has been unified, deeply unified in a national sense, as I point out in the book, culturally, um, uh, politically, so in terms of society, um, the idea that there will for all future continue to be two separate states mm. on the Korean Peninsula is almost unimaginable. Mm. I know that a lot of people, you know, see this the other way around. They, they are arguing since the two states have been separate now for, for, for a long period of time, for more than 70 years, that, that this is the kind of uh, situation that is going to exist uh, forever. That's a very short-term view, I think, in, in, in terms of how history uh, and identity actually work. Right? Um, so that's the one side of this, of this question. Uh, the other one, what could China, present-day China, the PRC, which is a, a, a state that is getting more and more significant internationally and also more and more authoritarian at home, at least so it seems at the moment, uh, what kind of Korea they're willing to accept. And that's where history really is significant, right? Because uh, what the time period, just the relatively brief time period in the overall perspective that I deal with in this book show is that that depends to a very large extent on the Koreans themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, how good they are at maneuvering in those kinds of settings when, when power shifts mm -hmm. um, and when uh, uh, China's policy then towards, say, a reunifying or reunified or working towards reunification Korea will actually be worked out. Is it possible to imagine a prosperous and democratic Korea next door to the kind of China that we see today? Yes, but only under circumstances where, you know, the, 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 the window of opportunity, the room for maneuver would be very, very narrow. I mean, a little bit similar to when the Qing took over and established their uh, their power in, in China in the, in the 17th century. So I think this is one of the reasons why it is really helpful to look at history, right? Mm -hmm. Because you discover both what you can do and how incredibly difficult it is, mm -hmm. right? How you really have to think it through. And very often, and this is for today's South Korea, think it over before it happens. Mm -hmm. And the Joseon were masters at doing that, at what we today would call scenario plan, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Interesting. All right, I'm going to open it up to this audience for questions. If we, uh, uh, anybody want to start? Yeah, Susan Thornton. Welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to get, kick it off and start us rolling here, but um, I want to make sure that I don't take up too much time because I have a chance to talk to Arnie at Yale sometimes. So. <laughs> But I just wonder, um, in terms of your last comment there, uh, uh, a Korean once asked me what I thought of the prospects um, of Finlandization for Korea mm. in the terms of Korea-China relations in the future. And since you're a Cold War also historian and you've studied that part mm. of the world, I'd love to hear what you, how you analyze that or what you think the relevant comparison and, and not relevant comparison is. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you, Susan. Um, that, is a great, that is a great question. Um, so being Scandinavian in origin, I always a little bit careful with the term Finlandization. And I, I heard that mm -hmm. Foreign Minister Stubb, the Finnish Foreign Minister, was just out saying that that's not uh, quite correctly. That's not what we want for Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. And he's absolutely right about that. And it's not what Korea should try to achieve, though there are elements in it, which basically means self-imposed restrictions, right, in, in terms of how you deal with a powerful neighbor. Could uh, I just interrupt and sure. say, I mean, I think that I, finalization is, as I think of it, and I don't yeah. know, is, is 
um, a country that is tied in, in, with respect to its values and systems and its uh, important connections mm. to the international community, to the Western yeah. diplomatic world, but right, it, it, it does not take the step of going into formal military alliances, for example. Is that what is that what Finlandization means? That's or? a that's 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 a very sort of positive, I think, interpretation <laughs> of Finlandization, sort of post Cold War in many okay, ways. So maybe, I mean, yeah. during during the Cold War, I think in this country for sure, but also in parts of Western Europe. Finlandization would more mean a very limited room for maneuver and, and, and almost uh, being ready to jump for whenever your, your, your great neighbors told you that you should jump, right? Um, which wasn't fair always with regard to Finland, um, but generally was the impression that was being created. So I think one has to take the sort of positive elements of this but also understand the immense difficulties of it, I mean, in, 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 the, in the Finlandization uh, case. So what that means is, again, this enormous emphasis on knowledge uh, with regard to your great neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the greatest Finnish president, in my view, of the Cold War era, Oro Kekkonen, uh, was a secret policeman. This was his background in intelligence. He knew how these things should be run because he knew that, again, they had to know more about the Soviets than the Soviets knew about them. It also meant a ability to be immensely brutal in fighting secret wars on your own territory against um, the Soviets and their agents. Uh, but it also meant setting up clearly what you would do and wouldn't do. And this is where the Joseon uh, parallel comes in, right? So would it, I mean, let us be concrete about this. Would it be possible for a future uh, reunified Korea moving in the direction that we now see in terms of increased Chinese power in Eastern Asia to keep the kind of alliance that it now has with the United States in place? Almost certainly not. But would it be possible to work out security guarantees of different kinds uh, that would draw in not just the United States, but also crucially Japan and others. Yes, that is possible, but it would be really difficult, as all of you know, from a Korean perspective, to start thinking in that direction. But one has to, because if you do want to be prepared for the kind of uh, thing that I think will happen as a, as a result of, of, of a northern collapse, which will happen at some point, um, then you have to think about it now. And you have to start thinking about, you know, what are you willing to do in order to move towards national unification in a way that the Chinese will accept? Because national unification in Korea is not going to happen if the Chinese are dead set to prevent it. I mean, that goes for today's regime in China, and it goes for any future regime in China that I can imagine. Do you perceive, because you've been uh, spending, I mean, you know China well, mm. you spent a lot of time there over the recent years, so you said you haven't been able and that to be back mm. for a little while. Mm. Um, a, a change in Chinese thinking, uh, your book reflects that there's some, there's some uh, uh, diversity of views in China about, about future scenarios for Korea, but are they mm. thinking about this and do you think it's changed? I mean, there's also, of course, the nuclear issue. So... <laughs> Last time I lived in Beijing, which was in 2019, so not that long ago, just pre-pandemic, and I was working on this book, um, it was very clear to me that there were, uh, you know, on a scale, relatively different views, uh, even among quite senior Chinese officials, mm -hmm. about how to think strategically about the relationship with Korea in the, in the longer run. Um, the, the two key issues, first and foremost, of course, the uh, relative value for China of the DPRK versus the ROK. That's a that's a key issue, on which there were very clear uh, differences. I mean, in, in in terms of view, and and the second one is, of course, the 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 uh, future relationship as seen from Beijing of uh, uh, Seoul's connections with with the United States and with with Japan. With, with, with Tokyo, where there were also different degrees, I think, of what, at least for a transition period, that uh, uh, Chinese top officials, including people now in office, would be willing to accept. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I mean, there are, there are differences. The, this is, has also been true historically. I mean, there were very significant differences, particularly towards the end of the Qing, with regard to how one viewed Korea. Mm -hmm. Some of the most dangerous ideas really came towards the end of the 19th century when there were groups 
within the Qing leadership who, who wanted to incorporate Korea fully into China to, to wipe out its national identity and, it, and independence, right? So Yuan Shikai was was there for exactly, what, a and, of and years Yuan Shikai was actually one of those that ended up. Um, this is the guy who tried to set himself up as emperor of China later on and failed miserably. But he was pretty uh, effective in in Korea as a kind of viceroy when he was there. He was actually not among the ones who wanted full incorporation, but there were people in Beijing advising the court who were saying. Uh, Look at all those other imperialist countries, Western imperialist right, countries. Right. They are out there uh -huh. taking control of Africa, taking control of other countries. If China is going to compete with them, it has to do something similar, and then Korea is first in line. So, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that you now sometimes you find it in this country, Susan, you know more about this than anyone, and 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 you find it in Korea that Chinese policy is. Uh, or political thinking is absolutely monolithic. That's simply not true. I don't think it's true even now, when when Xi Jinping has become more of a of a central figure, you know, than what he was before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Others, others, yes. Hi, Sean King, Park Strategies. So much of 20th and 21st century Korean nationalism has to do with ideas of ethnicity, bloodline, and race. How prevalent were these kinds of ideas in the earlier periods that you describe in your book? Thank you. Thanks, Sean. I'm sorry I can't respond in Swedish, but we could have a Scandinavian <laughs> discussion afterwards. Um, so I think this was very important. I mean, it was, and it was important mainly on the Korean side. I mean, it's the other side of the national identity idea, in a way, um, of um, that there is a Koreanness, including a Korean bloodline, that it is important to hold up and that it's important to keep uh, pure. I mean, one of the reasons why the reaction was so strong in terms of others who might have tried to settle in Korea during the Joseon period was because of some kind of thinking, you know, about that, right? It's very interesting when you contrast that historically to the thinking within the empire. So empires, you know, cannot do that, right? Uh, the, the empire can't, it, it's incredibly hard for an empire to become a nation state. And that's part of the you know problem I think that the People's Republic of China is trying to that, trying to work out today. They are an empire that tries to behave as if they were a nation state, and it's difficult to do that. And the the effects of it are sometimes very very negative. So I think there are some resonances of that even today. I think, uh, as you will know, I mean, if you if you look at North Korea and you look at the emphasis that you sometimes find there. Uh, of race and blood. Um, this is a, it's an extreme version of some of the tendencies that you found during Yosan to emphasize the Korean, the unique Korean ability to operate according to the set principles. Now those principles are the, in my view, rather twisted form of of communism that exists in the north. During the Joseon, it was Neo-Confucianism. So the point, particularly late Joseon, was that the Koreans had to be better at Confucianism than everyone else, including, including the Chinese. But also that for ethnic or blood reasons, Koreans were particularly, they were sort of created in order to carry out that Neo-Confucian mission. Mm. This is very interesting when you think about how that has played over to some of the Korean political debates of the 20th century. Right? Because no one, I mean, I, I, there is no evidence, as far as I know, of any Chinese political leader ever having claimed that. I mean, they claim cultural centrality, but that's a slightly different story. Right? Mm -hmm. But but as China moved from empire to nation, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it did become more, I mean, Han conscious right or or would yes um and and that is an ongoing process yeah. i mean the, the issue i think as we see today in, in 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 parts of the country is how successful is that unification going to be i mean i um very few empires if any empire um have been able to make that transition successfully Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, think about the Soviet Union and other, the sort of last great empires turned out in the end 
to be impossible to do. Um, uh, I think it will be very hard. That in terms of the, I mean, the, the Han concept, as you know, I mean, the people that I always refer to as Chinese, um, is a very modern construct. Uh, it's a very recent construct, mm -hmm. right? Um, in terms of the people who are incorporated into this so-called Han majority. And there are more tensions there as well, I think, than we are sometimes we are sometimes aware of. So this is a difficult project. I mean, it's going to take time. And particularly if China wants to be a, a real superpower, at least within its region, you know, that could put additional tensions into some of those relationships, as I think, you know, we are to some extent seeing already. And how do you, uh, this is kind of paraphrasing a question from Jonathan mm. Carrado, who helped organize this right. uh, event today. Uh, I, I mean, how do you see the, the uh, effort to kind of use Confucianism, or is there a Confucianism mm. uh, embedded somewhere in Xi Jinping thought or in the ongoing, uh, you know, campaign of the current regime in, in China to... Uh, to create, I mean, something you describe again I, in, in earlier history as being what's like a somewhat authoritarian central state that basically, you know, delivers prosperity for the people. Something. Only in a, to a, in, a, in a very vague sense, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, for most of those who studied recent Chinese history, which is one of the things that I've spent far too much time doing, um, you know, the idea that the Chinese Communist Party can reinvent itself as Confucian, and especially Neo-Confucian, almost beggars belief. You know? uh, this is a party that was founded, uh, in many ways, as an anti-Confucian party. I mean, that was part of the old China that it wanted to destroy. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly the neo you know, the Jewish, the, 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 the Neo-Confucian ideas from about a, a, a millennium ago were complete anathema you know, to the people who set up the, the, the Chinese Communist Party. There has been an attempt rhetorically at drawing on it, um, but it's unbelievably crude. I mean, it's, the, it's the, the, the kind of ideas that, you know, an elitist dictatorship has something to do with Confucianism. Well, possibly, but I mean, you know, yeah, then, yeah, then, yeah. then yeah. you know, it's one of those cases, almost Putin-like, where 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 everything becomes everything else, right? And and nothing really matters in terms of definitions. Yeah. Um, I don't think even the Chinese leadership today in the heart of hearts are are, are really there. Uh -huh. I mean, they don't they, they don't believe in this stuff. They oh. they know where they come from. They know their pedigree. They know, know their origins. Yeah. I might be wrong about this. I mean, some close Chinese friends disagree very strongly. And, and argue that there is the potential for a new neo-Confucian revolution in China, because after all, people have to believe in something. But I just, I just don't see it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I'm going to go to some of the online questions. Hi, <clears throat> Jay Kim from Ankara Consulting. Um, how do you see uh, the future of uh, China's uh, power su succession? having an impact on the Sino-Korea uh, relationship, as well as um, the growth of the Chinese uh, middle class, as well as uh, the current lack of uh, Chinese uh, cultural leadership or thought leadership mm. uh, overseas, mm. in the sense that they're not exporting uh, you know, movie stars or TV programs, they're exporting you know, manufactured products mm. predominantly. How do you see that um, having an impact on China's strategic relevance and therefore, the relevance in the Sino-Korea relationship. Mm. Those were really many questions in one, and they are, they are, they are difficult. They, they, they are, they are, they, they, in a way, they have to be dealt with separately. I mean, I think. So let, let me just concentrate on the very important issue that you brought up at the end uh, about the cultural reconstitution, which I believe that China will need at some point if it is going to be an effective great power. Right. Um, you know, it's true. I mean, some people, even in the discussion of this book, and particularly an earlier book that I did, say that, you know, great powers do not necessarily have to believe in something, right? Uh, did the British Empire have a, a core ideology? I think to some extent it did. I mean, it's a different kind of set of ideas from what we see with a, a Soviet empire or even an American empire, right? Um, there has to be a core. There has to be some kind of, you know, what you stand for gives you some kind of, if not cohesion, then at least credibility, you know, in the broader sense. And this is a huge problem, I think, for, 
uh, for the Chinese leadership now and will be so even more in the in the po post uh, Xi Jinping era because it, because it used to be economic progress, right? An economic progress over and beyond what you saw everywhere else. That time period, I think, is gone. I mean, I don't think the Chinese economy is going to go into freefall, but it, you know, it's never going to return to the kind of hyper growth that we have seen in the past. And 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 the the um, prospects for uh, economic modernization and, and intensification are going to move on. I mean, to other areas. Southeast Asia is the one that stands out to me, but there are others. Mm -hmm. There are others as well. So the question is, how how will a Chinese leadership handle that? trying to make China look more attractive as they transition over to, you know, away from economic growth meaning everything. Mm. Um, and I think that's going to be very difficult, I mean, for reasons that I have already pointed out. I think there is very little at the moment uh, that points in that direction. Um, there are attempts at putting Confucianism or even Neo-Confucianism yeah. at the center. As I said, I don't have much faith that that is gonna that's gonna succeed, and and this this is going to be a problem for China. I mean, national efficiency, as some people are trying to hold up now, particularly with regard to COVID response or with with regard to the Olympics, isn't enough to to say that these people have something going for them. I mean, the way the United States had something going for it as it grew to great power status. Right? So um, you know. Can that be overcome? Can can one construct a version of China that is more attractive? Yeah, but I, you know it takes a lot of work, and it's not necessarily something that goes easily along with increased authoritarianism. That's what we've seen elsewhere. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, um, I want to flip that back to I mean how it looks, especially from South Korea. We have a number of questions here about uh, that, that reflect I think the anxiety that South Korea feels about. China's uh, aggressiveness, uh, the way it's punished South Korea, you write about it for the THAAD missile deployment, for other things, for, you know, these, these arguments over, they all sound petty, but they're not, over kimchi and, you know, the hanbok and, and garlic and a lot of it, and maps and a lot of other things. Um, but, um, you know, I, just to reflect for a minute, I, 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 I was in Seoul in 1988 when the mm -hmm. Chinese and then the Soviets at that time came for the Seoul Olympics. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just, people were so thrilled. They were like Chinese, you know, they were here. Everything was going to, and then of course we had normalization in 1992. Yeah. So 30 years, 30 year anniversary of South Korea, uh, uh, China normalization, and this incredible economic uh, mm -hmm. relationship that developed. And the South Koreans I know of an old, the older generation, which I guess at this point I mean people like maybe in their 40s or 50s and older, they were always like, we know how to handle the Chinese, yeah. Yeah. you know. And there was a little bit of what you describe in this book, that there was some kind of deeply rooted sort of cultural thing, but we, you know, it was good economically, mm -hmm. very optimistic about it. Now, of course, mm -hmm. I mean, the situation seems completely different in many ways, although the economic ties are still very deep and strong. But especially if you look at polling, mm -hmm. I mean, China is more unpopular <laughs> in South Korea than Japan, um, you know, and, and that's before mm. some of the things that happened just in the Olympics, and mm. so that's why I mentioned the mm. Olympics yeah. in Beijing happened. I mean, China's not doing a very good job right now of winning hearts and minds in, in South Korea or maybe anywhere in the world. Um, so why is that? Why, I mean, mm. why, why are they so bad at this? And, and I guess, but the other part of the question, and this is what we have from people here mm. is, what more might South Korea do? Is it possible for South Korea, which is now a global power mm. in a way, I mean, mid-sized important power, mm. to, if you like, diversify from this mm. sense of, of being so overly dependent on China mm. and uh, uh, clearly the alliance with the United States is extremely important, but is this effort to deepen its ties around the world, including not only security, but economic with Southeast Asia and elsewhere, do you see that as, as yep. in the somewhat midterm historical you know, future? Uh, possible. But well, it's a tremendous challenge. Yeah. And I mean, the, the background here is, of course, and, and, and this is the key, I think, to understanding these developments that you quite correctly point out, Cathy, is that, you know, things change. I mean, the China that we're looking at now is a very different China from the China of the 1990s. Um, it's different in terms of its domestic composition. It's different in terms of its international policies from the ones that Deng Xiaoping and his leadership group uh, laid out. Um, it is much more self-confident, of course, in terms of carrying out foreign policy initiatives. It has a much worse relationship with the United States, which is, is critical. It has a much worse relationship with, with, with Japan, 
um, completely moving away from uh, what Deng Xiaoping used to say, which was that what he was most proud of in life was not modernization in China, nor normalization with the United States, but to have remade in a positive sense Sino-Japanese relations for future generations. Well, most of that is gone, right? So it is a different, you know, it's a very different kind of China. Um, it's also a, a different kind of China with regard to some of its policies towards the North, which we haven't spoken much about here, mm. but where you see just over the last couple of years, since that book was more or less finished, you see very significant changes in, in the direction of some people, mad as it may seem based on some of what I write in this book, are starting to see North Korea as a serious strategic asset for the PRC. Mm. Um, when I finished writing that mm. book, it was still regarded, at least in equal amounts, as a, as, as a, as, as a potential, um, uh, you know, potential positive for the future and a huge problem at present. Mm -hmm. right? um, that has moved on. Um, and of course, policy towards South Korea, in part as a result of this, has moved on as well. Um, uh, when I first started teaching uh, in South Korea I, you know, many, many years ago, I was struck by how friendly young Koreans were towards China. Yeah. And if you look at those same opinion polls, you find that if you go back to the 1990s, China consistently ranked highest mm -hmm. among young South Koreans of the countries that they admired most, mm -hmm. much higher than the United States. Mm -hmm. And the comparison with Japan was laughable. And now it's, I, I think it's about the same with regard to Japan. I mean, oh, it's, it's actually it's, worse. It's, it's, I mean, maybe it's, even worse. At least last week which or is, so. Which is quite remarkable. I mean, if you can, if you can, with regard to a neighbor, you know, think about yeah. a real foreign policy failure. Well, that, yeah. there, there, yeah. you, there you have one. So, you know, um, on the Korean side, what I'd say is, is obviously going back to what we discussed earlier um, in terms of preparations and in terms of thinking about the future is, of course, to, to become, in economic terms, less dependent on China than what is the situation today. And I'm not talking about here a government-imposed recalibration of the Korean economy, even if that were possible, which I don't think it is. But it is opening up uh, through the kind of, of initiatives that South Korea made its name for as it grew as a modern industrial power, new avenues in terms of what it can do in, in, as its economy transforms and grows even further. Mm -hmm. And um, some of that, even in economic terms to me, is of course dependent on the big elephant even in this room that we haven't talked about, which is the relation between South Korea and Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes to the annoyance of my Korean friends, I tend to be very outspoken on this. I mean, the idea that, that South Korea will have any possibility in the future to try to balance against a more assertive and possibly more aggressive China without a substantially closer relationship with Japan mm -hmm. um, is an entire chimera. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dream. It is not going to happen. And this might be perceptually... Uh, since we're now moving into an election uh, in South Korea, one of the biggest problems that the country has. I mean, I've seen very little in that election campaign. Now, this is a special election campaign that very few people can have much good to say about. That's true. But even, even that aside, so very little discussion about the strategic options and the strategic futures that South Korea has, even with regard to its own region. Right? So... Um, my old friends from the from the Joseon state, they would be horrified if they mm. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> horrified, because they would say, you know, the, it's all about balance. So I'm not trying to make a an ideal out of the Joseon here. As we all know the Joseon had its had its its many drawbacks and its 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 many problems. But in terms of survival, which this is all about, and survival almost against the odds, surrounded by great powers. You know, um, being in existence for more than 600 years is not bad. So they did something right on that, which we can learn from. And one of them was to be certain that you never ruled out whatever options you had within the region that you could deal with and that you could play with. Right? Um, and, and that has a lot 
for me to say about how South Korea envisages its international future. No, I'm glad you did. I mean, I'm I'm thinking now that I I mean I I think I feel like I do know some of the the success South Korean successors to those uh, strategic thinkers from the Chosun Dynasty, but I think they feel like in the current political climate in South Korea, their voices are are muffled, uh, and it's it's very challenging. I, I'm glad you point. Before we and I I know we're running a little bit over time. I hope you don't mind, and I hope we'll have a chance to chat with those who are here in person uh, when we finish up. But I, I think we we should touch at least a little bit on North Korea. And uh, I was intrigued by. I'd like you to say a little bit more about your your comment that perhaps China has moved from seeing uh, North Korea as more of a liability uh, to perhaps being a strategic asset. Um, mm. I I, yeah. I think that may be right, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you see that. Well, and it's also important to qualify that by saying that this only lasts up to the next point when the North Koreans um, feel a need to assert its independence with regard to China and does something that will seriously embarrass the Chinese. But maybe it lasts beyond that. I mean, this is actually one of the discussions in sort of US foreign policy settings is um, whether we may even have moved beyond that. I mean, that that the kind of constant um, embarrassment that the North Koreans for a very long period of time delivered to Beijing in a way that is not, um, uh, you know, cannot be incorporated into the CCP leadership's sense of centrality within the region. Um, this was a very mild way of saying that the issue is really that when you have one formal ally in the whole world that happens to be a decrepit dictatorship right next to you in North Korea and they keep on insulting you, you know, that's not good, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, but, you know, maybe we have moved even beyond that. I mean, it's possible to argue, and I'll be interested in hearing what people in the audience here would have to say on that, that North Korea has now become so important for China because so many people in Beijing think that it can be used against South Korea, that it can be used to control South Korea in many ways, uh, limit South Korea's options in the longer run, and perhaps mm. not even mm. just South Korea, but possibly mm. Japan too. Or tie down the U.S.? I mean, is it, or possi or, or, I mean, or... Possibly, though I think, um, well, I mean, there are other issues, of course, that issues. come into that relationship, not least a little bit further down the coast. Um, but, but certainly with regard to, to, to South Korea and, uh, uh, and Japan. So, you know, mm. I worry about this. I, I, also because I hear from people I know well in Beijing, even now on the kind of open lines that we must have uh, during COVID when everyone is listening in, <laughs> a, a, a different choice or words and terms with regard to North Korea than what you have found in the past. And, and uh, um, it does... It does worry me, also because I think from a Chinese perspective that this is a big mistake. Um, it is a mistake that could cost the Chinese quite dearly when, when things really go belly up with regard to Because it's at the expense of a better relationship with South Korea. Because of both. Because it ties you to a regime that the Chinese themselves know has no future, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least in its present form, has no future. And because it, it consistently and possibly for a very long time antagonizes everyone in, or almost everyone in South Korea, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is what I, when I speak to my Chinese friends uh, uh, using their language, like to call a loose-loose situation. You know, I mean, it's that they have maneuvered themselves into, mm -hmm. in a way, with regard to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, you have been very generous with your time and your oh, thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful. I want to thank the audience for coming here. I'm looking forward to having a little kind of informal conversation afterwards. You can stay for a minute. Thank you to our, I don't know where the camera is, our online audience for joining us. Come to New York when you can. Get the book. Uh, <laughs> you can order it online. Uh, and it's less than 200 pages. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kathy. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. That was great. Thank you.